Sup you beautiful people. Hope you've had a fantastic day. Welcome back to another new episode of What If Naruto Was A Sage Among Wizards. If you guys enjoyed this what if, comment down below and let me know. And go ahead and check out other what ifs in the channel after watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like, and also share this video with your friends. Before we get into it though, check out Bill Billy Comics. Bill Billy Comics is the official trusted place to read hit exclusive series from top creators. Bill Billy Comics is a great online webtoons and web comics reader among all reading apps. Enjoy the best new comics, manhwa, and exclusive webtoons on Bill Billy Comics. Download the app now and jump right into it. The link is in the description. Now let's start this video. When Harry had first learned that all of the children attending Hogwarts went directly to King's Cross Station in London, then took a train to Hogwarts, he had been incredulous. Even for those who lived in London, it was an agonizingly inconvenient process, given the existence of multiple nearly instantaneous methods of magical travel. Add in those students who lived closer to Hogwarts than London, and it was even worse. In fact, as the only fully magical village, there would on average be more students coming from Hogsmeade itself than from any other single location in Britain. So those students would travel from Hogsmeade to London, then spend most of the day traveling by train all the way back to end up where they left that morning. But after actually taking the train, Harry began to understand how such a seemingly insane tradition came into being. It was a perfect situation to allow the new students to bond. Create the beginnings of what would be important friendships for years, hopefully anyway. But to renew such friendships for returning students, he supposed. So as the train finally came to a stop in Hogsmeade Village, long after dark, Harry was still laughing with his new friends, as they wandered out of the train and towards Hogwarts. All of them could do with some maturing in various ways, but that was to be expected, given their ages. Harry was just trying to live a real childhood, something he never had as Naruto, so he tried his best to not let Hermione's pushiness, Neville's excessive shyness, or Ron's overly brash and occasionally abrasive manner bother him, but it was a work in progress. Fur's years. Fur's years over here. All right there Harry. Hagrid's booming voice interrupted his thoughts. Harry grinned and dragged his new friends over towards the huge man. Hey Hagrid. Doing well, how are you? Oh, this is Hermione, Ron, and Neville. They're first years like me. Each of them greeted the man with various levels of white-eyed shock. Hagrid quickly nodded towards them, then said, Good to meet all of you. Have to talk later though. For now justice follow me down to the lake. He then raised his already naturally loud voice to his previous truly booming level, as he yelled out once more time, All right. First years, follow me. Come on first years. He led the group of first years away from the rest of the students, and down a fairly steeply sloping path from the small train platform, with only Hagrid's tiny lantern to light the way. Or at least it seemed tiny in the man's huge hand, and didn't supply nearly enough light for most of the children to see the rocky ground. Of course Harry could see fine in anything short of absolute darkness, but he did have to catch the others a few times, especially Neville, who was a little on the clumsy side. But that wasn't what he was putting most of his attention to. No, it was the two men under some kind of invisibility spell hiding in the bushes off to the side of the path. Though actually, as they got closer, Harry could tell that it wasn't really an invisibility spell directly on the men, but rather that they were under some kind of object with the invisibility spell on it. The cloak, most likely, from what Harry could tell about the origins of the magic he could see with his Sharingan. But what concerned him even more than two men apparently in hiding for a group of small children, was that they started sending some kind of subtle spell at each of the first years as they went past. They had ignored Hagrid though, which seemed to indicate it wasn't immediately harmful magic, at least. If they were going for an outright attack, they certainly would have targeted the obvious threat of Hagrid first. Instead they were just going for the children. Strange. So Harry just watched as several of the students ahead of him were hit. They didn't seem to notice anything, or exhibit any reaction at all to whatever the spell was. And Harry couldn't tell what it was doing, either. It was far too complicated for Harry's limited knowledge of magic. If he had to guess, he would say this was the trace spell for tracking underage magic he had read was placed on all 11 year old before they started learning magic. But one thing he did know was that regardless of what it did, he wasn't going to allow it to take hold of him. Because whatever it did, it was connecting directly with each of the student's chakra coils. Or magical core, as they called it now. He had no idea why it would do that, but he has seen it happen once before. To himself, to be precise. At some point before his souls had joined, some sort of monstrously complex magical spell had established itself, linking directly into his chakra coils. To this day, he had no idea what the thing was or what it did, but it was probably over 100 times as complicated and powerful as whatever those two men were casting. So of course Harry had moved it. He had wanted to destroy it outright, but he had been pretty sure that at least part of the spell included some sort of link to some other spell elsewhere. So damaging the spell might have informed someone that something was wrong. So instead he just moved it over into his cousin Dudley. Of course Dudley's chakra coils were an incredibly pathetic thing, but that didn't seem to matter. 
The spell didn't actually draw any magic, or at least not in its standard passive state. It just needed to be connected to the chakra coils. And Dudley's coils worked for that, pathetic barely their things or not. Based on reading his introduction to magic book, he was pretty sure Dudley qualified as what they called a squib, as did Aunt Petunia. Unlike most people, they did have excess spiritual energy. That's not enough to actually power even the weakest of spells. The moving of the spell had been ridiculously difficult though. It had taken him six months to figure out how, carefully pried the thing away from where it was partially merged with his chakra coils, and gently shift the thing into Dudley. He refused to go through that again. Granted, it would be significantly faster with this new spell, given his experience and this one's lesser complexity. But it still wasn't something he wanted to go through again, so he just tore the spell apart with his chakra as it approached him, and did the same for those aimed at Hermione, Ron, and Neville while he was at it. The people hiding didn't seem to notice anything was wrong, so he just gave a tiny shrug, and continued down the path to where a group of small boats were tied up at the edge of a large lake. But there were much more impressive things to see than the boats, because Hogwarts itself came into view just as they came around the final bend in the path. Harry gasped along with everyone else as they fell silent and stared on wonder. Though he would guess that his gasp was for a very different reason. The architecture, landscaping, and view of the castle, were nothing particularly spectacular to Harry. He had seen plenty of sights that equaled or surpassed Hogwarts in that regard. He could probably make its equal himself in a day or so between a lot of clones and even more earth manipulation. No, what shocked Harry was the amount of natural energy running through the area around Hogwarts, and in fact through the castle itself. Mount Mayaboku was the only place he had ever seen with an equal level of natural energy. Even from where Harry was standing, he could tell that the levels were elevated beyond the normal amounts, but the amounts running through the castle itself were truly incredible. But Harry forced himself to shake off his awe after a few moments as he turned to Ron, having realized the red-headed boy said something while he was distracted. What was that Ron? Oh, I said it was pretty incredible, isn't it mate? Ron responded. Harry just nodded as he stared for a few more seconds. This would be something he would have to look into more carefully. That level of natural energy had to be important in some way, and might make some of Harry's projects easier as well. The most important of which would be making another attempt to contact the toads from here. His earlier attempts over the years since his souls joined, had all been met with total failure, and he had no idea why. Hopefully he would have greater success from an area of such rich natural energy. He could consider that and other possible uses for this much natural energy later though. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, he answered Ron. Anyway, come on. Let's grab a boat. No more in for to a boat. Hagrid yelled out as the group slowly approached the waiting boats. Harry quickly claimed one of them, and helped the other three carefully climb in without tipping the thing over. Everyone in shouted Hagrid, who had claimed one boat to himself, and even then almost dropped the edge below the water level from his weight. Upon seeing that everyone had settled into at least reasonably safe positions, he yelled out, all right then. Forward. The trip across was not particularly fast, and the surface of the lake was as smooth as glass. Not to mention that the students were mostly silent as they looked up at the castle. So of course Harry was pretty bored. Harry could fix that though. So he looked over to Malfoy's boat briefly, and put a band of thickened air around one of Malfoy's bodyguards. Harry didn't even know which one, but it didn't matter as he forced the boy's arm to jerk up and blatantly shove Malfoy out of the boat and into the water. It was probably just an excuse at this point, but he had seen Malfoy looking down his nose as he refused some girl who had asked to join Malfoy and his two goons in their boat. Was it petty? Sure. Was it immature? Almost certainly. Was it small-minded? Probably, yes. He was sure he had been going somewhere with this at some point. Oh well. It was funny, which was mostly what Harry cared about. And most of the other students seemed to agree, as most were at least snickering as Malfoy floundered in the water and yelled for help. Even Hagrid's beard seemed to twitch as if he was trying to repress his smile, as he grabbed the back of Malfoy's dripping robes, and dropped the silk board back into his boat. You all right there? Hagrid asked Malfoy with at least a little genuine concern. Upon receiving a hesitant and still shocked nod, Hagrid turned to the boy who had shoved him. Gregory Goyle. I haven't seen something like that in all my years tacking the furs years cross the lake. I'll speak to your head of house once you get one, you can believe that. You do it again, and I might just as have you swim the rest of the way too. This was enough to bring Malfoy out of his shock, and the boy began to shriek in a rather unpleasantly high-pitched voice, something about how Goyle could dare to do something like that, and of course, how his father would hear about it. This brought the other boy out of his own shock, as he began to hesitantly try to explain that he hasn't meant to, or something along those lines. It was mostly lost in Malfoy's much angrier and shriller diatribe, and Harry wasn't really paying attention to their words anyway. Malfoy's limply hanging hair that was once so carefully coiffed and equally soaked expensive silk robes, were just too amusing. 
After landing the boats and walking up a path to Hogwarts, Hagrid knocked on a very solid wooden door and handed off the first years to a very stern-looking woman who was introduced as Professor McGonagall. McGonagall then escorted them all into the huge entrance hall and gave a welcome to Hogwarts, along with a spectacularly uninformative introduction to the sorting and the houses, which effectively did nothing more than name the houses. Their suggestion that they smartened themselves up while staring at Malfoy's imitation of a soaked cat was pretty funny though. She then left the group of first years alone at the entrance hall, as she entered through the door opposite the one the group had entered the castle through. A few of the students started to nervously chatter among themselves, mostly over conjecture about what the sorting ceremony would be. Harry wasn't concerned though, so he decided to use this time to see more of the castle. Not waiting any longer, he switched his eyes from their current showering into the Byakugan. The Byakugan was one of the three eye based bloodlines he had taken during his life as Naruto, and the last he had obtained. It had been the only one of the three he had gotten after the fourth great shinobi world war, in fact. Hiyashi Hyuga really should have known better than to try and organize an assassination attempt against him though. After Hiyashi had stepped down in favor of his daughter Hinata taking over as the clan head of the Hyuga, he and the rest of the Hyuga elders had objected rather strongly against Hinata, abolishing the caged bird seal on the branch family of the Hyuga. Of course neither he nor Hinata particularly cared what that group of useless old men thought, so they had gone ahead with it. Naruto had actually empathized with Hiyashi's position to some extent, as the rest of the elders had been in favor of assassinating Hinata rather than him. Hiyashi had pushed for Naruto's death as the only living sealmaster skilled enough to remove the caged bird seal, rather than trying to kill Hinata, which Naruto appreciated. Still, he couldn't let the attempted assassination of their own Hokage go, so he had to execute all of the elders, including using his bloodline theft seal, to take the strongest of the elders Byakugans, that of Hiyashi Hyuga. Though as much as him having to execute Hinata's father had bothered him at the time, he did have to admit that there being no surviving Hyuga elders, had greatly simplified her job of running and modernizing the Hyuga clan. He sometimes debated if he should have bothered with obtaining the Byakugan though. The Byakugan granted the ability to see with 360 degree vision, see through solid objects, and see long distances up to about 10 miles for him. Though he had never approached the master Hinata had eventually achieved with the Byakugan. All of these things were useful, but rarely more useful than the abilities of either the Sharingan or the Rinnegan, so he rarely activated this particular eye. But he did now, and he immediately regretted it. Whoever had built Hogwarts was as insane as they were brilliant. The spatial distortion which had gone into the building was beyond incredible. Everywhere the space of rooms and hallways had been expanded or otherwise distorted, leaving something that made an Escher painting seem downright childish. The space overlapped and passed through itself in ways that should have been impossible. Straight hallways that should have crossed each other instead passed above or below each other. Full-sized rooms filled the space within a single wall or even the same space as other rooms. Things impossible in three dimensions layered on top of each other in impossible ways, and all of this is Byakugan eyes, tried to take in and make sense of in the span of a single second. Worse, he had switched to them with a fair amount of chakra flowing to his eyes, which meant he saw everything around him for miles all at once, rather than a much smaller few hundred feet, with the minimum chakra needed to activate the eyes. This mumbly wasn't much of a problem. He had trained himself to be able to take in enormous amounts of visual information extremely quickly, but this was just too much. As his eyes tried to sort out what he was seeing, a spike of agony was sent straight into his brain, as Harry desperately cut off full chakra flow to his eyes before he passed out. He was hardly surprised to find himself on the floor as he slowly regained his bearings. The blood dripping from his eyes as was a bit of a shock though. He knew that the Sharingan could produce that bleeding from the eyes effect when they were pushed beyond their capacity, but it had never happened with the Byakugan that he was aware of. The various screams and yells of the surrounding children probably should have been expected too, though with his sudden migraine, they were not particularly appreciated. Harry. Harry, are you alright? He managed to discern Hermione's frantic yelling from all the others, so he slowly nodded to her and pushed himself upright off of the ground into a sitting position. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. That was weird. Harry carefully wiped away the blood running down his cheeks, and pushed himself back to his feet. At the moment his eyes had taken enough damage that anyone else would have been blind, and his headache, if it could be called that, was severe enough most would be unconscious. It was hardly the first time something like that had happened to him though, even in this lifetime. And the healing provided by his own bloodline, accelerated by the power of the juby flowing through him, should fix that up within the next couple hours. Unfortunately, damage to his eyes always healed the slowest, given their enormous complexity between all three of his eye-based bloodlines. He could regrow limbs faster than he could heal even moderate damage to his eyes. Yet another reason to sometimes regret the inclusion of the Byakugan, since it slowed that process further for relatively little gain. But until then, the blurry shapes around him wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Anyone trained to fight blind could maneuver through a world that was merely dim and fuzzy without trouble. And his impressive levels of pain tolerance could handle the rest. 
leaving Hermione shrieking, which sent enough pain lancing from his ears that he used chakra to lessen his sense of hearing for the time being. Weird. You passed out and started bleeding out of your eyes. We need to get you to a doctor. Harry, now upright and as compassed as ever, though his robes were slightly wrinkled now, gave his best rakish grin as he responded, yeah, but I'm fine now. Oh look. Ghosts. He pointed casually at the floating specters which had approached the group while they all stared at Harry. This distracted people enough to take their focus away from Harry at least for the moment. There were even quite a few more screams, which surprised Harry. For at least those who grew up in the magical world, ghosts shouldn't be particularly frightening. Thus from reading his introduction to the magical world book, Harry knew that Hogwarts was apparently crawling with the things, and they were not exactly uncommon in other magical areas either. So Harry just let their words pass over him, as he focused on his slowly healing eyes and clearing headache until McGonagall returned. Fortunately his vision did clear up at least enough to briefly activate his Rinnegan with the ghosts still in view, even if they were a bit blurry. Ever since he read about ghosts, he had been quite curious. The Rinnegan could actually see souls, among other things. But he hadn't been sure if the ghosts he read about in his introduction to magic book were truly the souls of the dead, somehow barred from continuing on to the afterlife or something else. It turned out after a brief examination with the Rinnegan that they were something else. There were no actual souls there, just a complicated and confusing mass of magic. In fact it was rather similar to the magic he had seen on some of the moving paintings along the walls of Hogwarts, though significantly less structured. Which probably meant it was just some sort of accidental magic spell released as a witch or wizard, desperately tried to use their magic to preserve their lives when they were dying. Or possibly even just some natural effect in areas of high concentrations of natural energy, when the excess spiritual energy witches and wizards had was released on their death. Harry wasn't really sure, and honestly didn't care much. Either way it meant they were a magical structure which contained at least some of the memories of the person who died. What he was interested in is if he could force the effect to take place with a living person, and if he could access the memories stored within a ghost. Currently his most effective method of information gathering was to literally rip someone's soul out with the power of the Rinnegan, and absorb the knowledge of that person. Which killed them, obviously. And that was unfortunate. There had been far too many times he wanted to get at someone's knowledge without actually killing them. This seemed a likely avenue to do so. It would also be a much faster and easier method of learning magic while he was at it, though that would likely make his classes at Hogwarts even more boring than they were already going to be. So he was hesitant, but still interested in at least having the option. Move along now, McGonagall stated in her standard humorless voice, and slightly pinched expression, as she once again emerged from the Great Hall, this time leaving the door behind her open. That woman was far too uptight to be the head of Gryffindor as he had heard she was. Gryffindor was supposed to be almost as famous for its pranksters and parties as it was for its members being stupidly brave. Excessive sternnesses was always a terrible method of dealing with such things. Especially among those brave enough to ignore the warnings of teachers. If he got his wish to be in her house, by the time he was done with this school, she would be forced to either loosen up or possibly have a psychotic break. Hopefully it would be the first. People always got annoyed when he caused psychotic breaks. He had only caused one in the past decade though, which was pretty good for him. He was sure Sakura would have been proud. Or some approximation of proud, at least. The kind of proud that came with beating sometimes he wondered why he missed Sakura so much. The sorting ceremony is about to start, McGonagall continued, hopefully without any idea of what Harry was currently thinking. Now form a line and follow me. As they walked towards the door McGonagall had opened, Hermione guided Harry's elbow and whispered to him once again, are you sure you are alright Harry? Secretly Harry was thankful for her assistance, but he made sure he didn't put any weight on Hermione's grasp. He did stop sending chakra to his eyes to keep his Rinnegan active though. His eyes would heal more quickly if none of his eye bloodlines were activated. Not that anyone else could tell the difference behind the seals and illusions hiding anything odd about his eyes. Yeah, he whispered back. I'm fine now. I can talk to the nurse later if you want, but I don't want to miss the sorting. Besides, the nurse is probably in there with everyone else anyway. If I do collapse again, she can help me there better than me going to an empty nurse's office would. I'm really fine though. In fact, he wouldn't be going to talk to the nurse, now or ever. He had no idea what magical detection methods magical healers had available, but there were concrete differences between his body and that of a normal 11-year-old, which would be almost impossible to hide. Putting an illusion over his eyes so that what was really a blood-red iris with rotating black geometric shapes looked like their normal bright green was one thing. If they had a spell which actually gave a detailed analysis of the composition and makeup of his eyes, even if they were inactive, his eyes would show as incredibly different from anything normally found in a human wizard or otherwise. And the rest of his body wasn't a lot better. Having chakra constantly flowing through his muscles and bones caused them to be slightly denser and actually structured a little differently. Again, it wasn't something that could be detected by an external view, but any detailed medical scan would detect it. 
and that wasn't even considering if they could do genetic scans. But all his bloodlines and some additional mutations because of the power of the Juby flowing through him, he wasn't even sure if he technically qualified as human. He had once allowed Sakura to do a detailed medical analysis of him, and immediately had the thing destroyed. It had been an interesting red even for him though, and he would never be called anything remotely approaching a medical specialist. He had no desire for anyone to have similar knowledge of his physical makeup anytime soon. But Hermione hesitantly nodded and accepted Harry's explanation, with Neville seemed concerned as well. Though Ron appeared to have taken his reassurance of face value and was just looking around the room with interest. Fortunately, as they entered the Great Hall, even Hermione's attention was taken away from Harry and to the ceiling, which appeared to have been spelled to be transparent and allow a clear view of the night sky. It was probably more interesting to the others, but for Harry, it seemed that Hogwarts was the only place on Earth that he couldn't see through the ceiling whenever he wanted. Hermione certainly seemed impressed though, as she whispered informatively, it's bewitched to look like the sky outside. I read about it in Hogwarts, a history. But Harry was just glad to have any distraction from his own condition, as he continued to gather himself and rapidly heal. And fortunately, once in the Great Hall, what looked like an old and tattered hat, provided further distraction, as it sang a long and fairly ridiculous song, which gave no information at all that Harry didn't already know, besides that the hat itself would apparently be doing the sorting. That was new, even for him though. A sentient hat whose sole purpose appeared to be to sort children once a year. Which seemed kind of pointless upon further thought. Of course he knew how to make sentient objects with seals, but he had never bothered much. There had been a brief period in which some of his children had gone a little overboard with making sentient weapons, after he taught them how. His opinion that it was never worth it because the things were mostly just annoying rather than useful, had eventually been proven correct though. It would be interesting to see if this sorting hat was any more useful than his own attempts at sentient creations. Harry was betting no. Once the sorting hat song was complete, McGonagall began reading out each of the students' names, calling them up to sit on the stool and have the hat placed on their head, after which it would call out what house they were supposed to go into. Harry still had no idea how it was deciding which house, but it didn't really matter to him. If the hat wanted to dig through his head, it was going to fail. He had already seen many things magic might do better than chakra, but for pure brute force, chakra was simply much more powerful. And brute force that magic simply could not supply was what it would take to break through his mental defenses. He did make sure to memorize the names of each of his fellow first years, and what house they went into for future reference though. For now, the only ones he really cared about were Hermione, then Neville, both of whom got sorted into Gryffindor, though both took longer than most of the other sortings. Potter, Harry, McGonagall called. Finally, it was his turn, and the rest of the hall fell silent in a way that they had not for any other name. Likely each was just now noticing his scar now that they knew to look for it on him. So Harry took these few moments of total silence to stride forward confidently towards the front of the Great Hall, which set off a wave of whispers rushing through the Great Hall. Harry just ignored it though. He was far too used to people whispering about him. Sometimes good things, sometimes terrible. It had taken quite a few years, but he had eventually gotten to the point that he just let it wash over him, and barely even noticed. The only opinion that mattered to him now was that of his friends. So finally he reached the stool and sat down gracefully as McGonagall placed a hat over his head, allowing it to drop down over his eyes to rest on his nose. The long moment of silence passed before the hat stated, if you could lower your occlumency barriers, that would be very helpful Mr. Potter. The wave of whispers which had just barely finished dying down once more swept through the great hall at this pronouncement, with those students close enough to hear likely passing the words on to those further away. But Harry remained calm and responded with a firm voice, I have no idea what occlumency barriers are. Technically he was lying. Although he had never heard the term occlumency before, given the context, he could assume the hat was trying to poke around in his brain, and had come up against the mind-walking shields Eno taught him to create so long ago. Harry was fine with the hat and everyone else making whatever assumptions they wanted though. Hmm interesting. Never heard of occlumency, you say. Could be a natural occlumens, I suppose. Though it doesn't feel quite right. If you are lying, there is no need. Anything I learn in your head is strictly confidential and used only for the purposes of sorting you. Harry almost laughed, though he was able to maintain his calm mask with some difficulty. The idea of the hat not reporting whatever interesting information it found digging around in his head was ridiculous. If it was as old as it looked and had been serving the purpose of sorting students for the entire history of Hogwarts about 1000 years, from what he could gather well, the concept of a right to privacy from one's lord didn't even exist back then. Not to mention that it would be downright irresponsible to not report information on a potentially dangerous student to the headmaster for the sake of everyone's safety. A student like him, in this case. No, he wasn't going to be opening his mind to the hat or anyone else anytime soon. The concept of a natural occlumens did seem useful though. Apparently some rare people were just naturally immune to people messing with their minds. That would be a useful excuse. 
though he was curious why such a thing hadn't been mentioned in his Lost Powers book. It seemed like exactly the sort of unusual ability that would have fit into a book like that. He would have to look into what exactly an Aquamans did at some later point. Um I'm not lying, Harry lied very sincerely. If I have these Aquamancy barriers, I don't know how to drop them. Fortunately, Harry had grown to be a rather talented liar in his lifetime as Naruto. It turned out that his overly enthusiastic happy mask he used in his childhood to draw attention had served as a strong basis in this field once he began to work on that particular area of his ninja skills shortly after the fourth great shinobi world war. And like everything else he practiced, he had nothing if not time to perfect his skills. Well, I must warn you that I am required to test you on this. We had a rash of students with occlumency training, claiming to be natural occlumens after the first real natural occlumens passed under my brim back in 1095. So I am required to call upon the power of Hogwarts itself to attempt to break your shields, if you do not lower them now. If you are a natural Aquamans, this won't hurt you, but if you are not, it will be quite painful. And whatever shields you have created will fail, I assure you. Harry gave a shrug and responded, I'm not doing anything. Or if I am, I don't know how to stop. So feel free to do whatever, I guess. Harry wasn't worried. As impressive as the natural energy flowing through Hogwarts was, it was no match for the power Harry contained. The last time he had done a rough calculation, including both the power of the Jubi and his own chakra, he housed roughly as much energy as a quarter of the entire planet's natural energy. The energy, highly concentrated or not, of one small valley was nothing in comparison. Granted, the majority of the total power contained within him was the Jubis. And it would be bad if he had to start pulling on that chakra, since using more than insignificant amounts of the Jubis chakra had an immediate visible effect. Not to mention the inherent evil and corruption within the Jubi's chakra, which even magic users would be able to sense if he started channeling significant amounts of it. He really didn't need questions about that coming up this early. It didn't end up being a problem though. The hat's attempts to invade his mind had started as a scalpel trying to cut away his shields. Unfortunately scalpels were not particularly effective against what was the mental equivalent of a 50 foot thick wall of steel. Adding the power of Hogwarts to the attempt was a little like putting that scalpel onto the front of a tank and driving it full speed into the wall. Impressive, but still totally ineffective. Finally the hat gave a long sigh and stated, Very well, Mr. Potter. I cannot sort you. The standard method of sorting natural occlumens is to have a meeting with the heads of the houses to discuss what house you would best fit. Just put me in Gryffindor, please. Harry responded politely but firmly. There was a short pause before the hat answered, I cannot sort you, Mr. Potter. I cannot get past the barriers in your mind, even with the power of the Hogwarts supporting me. Harry shrugged casually. So what? You seem to just put everyone else either wherever they want to go or where their parents went anyway. I know Hermione Granger seemed more suited to Ravenclaw, but she wanted Gryffindor, so that is where you put her. Draco Malfoy is, as far as I can tell, totally lacking in cunning with his only ambition to be exactly like his father, but you didn't even get all the way onto his head before you were saying Slytherin. Likely simply because he was mentally shouting that was where he wanted to go. He glanced over at Malfoy, waiting to see if he would get another way, until my father hears about this is. But the boy still seemed rather pale and in shock that the mudbloody had made enemies with so quickly was Harry Potter. Harry doubted Malfoy's father would be pleased to hear that. So Harry just continued, and Gregory Goyle and Vincent Crabbe. Those two are either the craftiest boogers to ever walk the halls of Hogwarts, as they hide their intelligence behind incredibly realistic masks of being stupid followers. Or, much more likely, they actually are just stupid followers, and have no business being in Slytherin. For that matter, no one who is actually clever enough to warrant Slytherin, would want to announce to the world how cunning they are, so the fact that anyone who actually expresses a desire to be in Slytherin actually gets in, proves you just put people wherever they want to go. Though I am confused as to why anyone would want to go into a house widely believed to be filled with untrustworthy dark wizards anyway. I would think that untrustworthy dark wizards would want to go there least of all. The hat made a sound as if it was clearing its throat among the snickers, an outright laughter moving through the students, and the stern frowns on the faces of the professors. Well, the kind of person someone wants to be does contribute to who they will become, as does how their parents raise them, but I do have to see into your mind to make sure that the traits of your desired house do exist, or I won't put you there, no. So as I said, I cannot sort you. You will have to speak to the heads of houses and try and convince them that Gryffindor is the house for you. Harry shrugged yet again and lifted the hat off his head, and handed it back to McGonagall. So when do we meet to decide my house, Professor? Harry asked the woman. She glanced up to Dumbledore with an uncertain expression, but eventually looked back at Harry and replied, Why don't you sit with Gryffindor for now, and we can meet after the feast to determine your permanent house. Harry grinned and walked over to sit between Hermione and Neville, as the Gryffindors gave a hesitant and uncertain applause. You shouldn't say things like that about the sorting hat Harry. Hermione whispered reproachfully at him. It is an ancient artifact that has been sorting for a thousand years. 
Harry laughed loudly enough to draw some questioning looks and replied, A maybe it has gotten senile in all those centuries of sorting. Or more likely all those centuries of sitting on a shell somewhere with nothing to do 364 days out of the year. He quickly cut off her objection as he continued, but I just wanted to be in the house with my friends, so I said whatever I needed to convince it. Another lie, but it was one that made Hermione end her attempts to argue as she blushed brightly and quietly muttered, friends. As much to herself as to Harry. In actuality, he wasn't the sort that would allow what house he was in to come between him and his friends regardless, so that hadn't really been a part of his reasoning at all. Given his personality, he would probably fit within any of Slytherin, Gryffindor, or Hufflepuff. Slytherin was out for exactly the reason he had verbally given the hat. Plus the fact that the rate of Slytherin fatalities would probably eventually hover around 50% if he had to actually share a dorm with those idiots. Hufflepuff well, honestly loyalty was probably his most treasured trait. But he also didn't want to spend 7 years explaining to people that he only worked hard on things that mattered, and that school essays didn't. He doubted that would go over well with the puffs. Which left Gryffindor. And he certainly had plenty of the suicidal bravery Gryffindor was known for, so he should fit best here. Besides, from what he heard, they had the best parties. But Harry didn't allow any of these thoughts to show on his face, as he nodded to Hermione and smiled brightly. Yeah, of course we're friends. He then turned back to watch the rest of the sorting. A few minutes later, Ron also got sorted to Gryffindor two especially loud cheers from Harry and Ron's numerous brothers, followed by Blaise Zabini going into Slytherin to end the sorting ceremony. Dumbledore then stood up in front of the gathered students, his arms raised wide and a bright smile visible behind his impressive beard. Welcome, he said. Welcome to a new year at Hogwarts. Before we begin our banquet, I would like to say a few words. And here they are. Nitwit. Blobber. Oddmund. Tweak. Thank you. He then sat back down, and huge piles of food appeared in front of them on the table. Harry honestly wasn't sure what to think. Headmaster Dumbledore seemed like a lot of fun, and the feast was fairly impressive, but there was no ramen. How could they call something a feast if there was no ramen? Harry felt like he should object, but he was fairly certain it wouldn't accomplish anything. So he was left a bit more morose than the circumstances would normally call for, but he did eat his fill and casually chatted with Hermione, Neville, and Ron. Though Ron's table manners were a little on the disgusting side, so Harry tried not to ask him questions, since he consistently didn't bother to stop and swallow before he answered. Harry couldn't really object though, since his table manners had been just as poor the first time he had been 11. Though at least he had the excuse of not having parents to teach him any better. But regardless, the meal passed in comfortable chatter and good food. Though not the best food, as Harry was constantly reminded. They did have trickle tarts among the desserts though, which Harry had found to be almost as good as ramen. And the pumpkin juice tasted basically like a liquid version of pumpkin pie, and was far better than it sounded. He also got the questionable treat of being horrified by Neville's family as well. Apparently they used to try and almost kill him fairly regularly to try and force his magic out. Because apparently it was better for him to be dead than not have magic in that family. Worse, the people around him were treating that as fairly ordinary. Harry would have to speak to him later in private about it. No child should have to feel worthless if they didn't have a single trait that they had no control over. That actually might be the root of much of Neville's problems, actually. And so, a meal filled with mixed reactions finally came to an end, and the remains of the desserts disappeared as Dumbledore stood once more. Ahem just a few more words now that we are all fed and watered. Dumbledore said with his apparently standard white smile. I have a few start of term notices to give you. First year should note that the forest on the grounds is forbidden to all pupils. And a few of our older students would do well to remember that as well. Dumbledore's grin and oddly twinkling eyes turned to face the Gryffindor table at those words. Specifically at the Weasley twins from what Harry could tell. They would probably be a good resource to get some tips on what sorts of interesting things could be found in this forbidden forest before he went exploring there. I have also been asked by Mr. Filch, the caretaker, to remind you all that no magic should be used between classes in the corridors. Quidditch trials will be held in the second week of the term. Anyone interested in playing for their house team should contact Madame Hooch. And finally, I must tell you that this year, the third floor corridor on the right hand side is out of bounds to everyone who does not wish to die a very painful death. Harry was excited once again. Dumbledore continued on with a few more comments and leading in the Hogwarts song, if it could be called that. But even that hideously awful thing with everyone singing to different tunes, didn't significantly distract Harry. He was still focused on one thing. Hogwarts sounded much more interesting than the introduction to magic book had made it sound. Calling Hogwarts the safest place in breeding, had made him question if he should attend. In his experience, when people said safe, what they really meant was boring. But that third floor corridor thing sounded awesome. He would have to check that out tonight. Albus Dumbledore was not pleased. Not pleased at all. Things were not going according to plan. 
He had already gotten a strong indication that something had gone very wrong in his plans for Harry Potter based on Hagrid's report. But Hagrid wasn't exactly the most observant sort, so he had hoped what Hagrid had indicated was a result of the man looking for what he had hoped to see in Harry. A strong, confident, happy, and magically powerful young boy, pleased to be introduced to the magical world, both excited by many topics, Hagrid also found fascinating and fully willing to accept the half-giant, as so many in the magical world were not. That shouldn't have been what Hagrid actually found. Albus had carefully examined the minds of the Dursleys before he left Harry there, not to mention Minvera's comments about them. They were petty, bigoted fools afraid of magic and bitterly jealous of anything related to Lily. Of course he hadn't wanted Harry actually abused, and he had placed several monitoring spells into the house's wards to make sure he could catch such a thing and prevent it from going too far if it had happened. But he had wanted Harry unloved. That sort of environment where Harry grew up safe, but with no sense of family or connection to anyone who loved him beyond vague stories of his parents, it should have left him shy, withdrawn, and terribly unprepared for the life of a celebrity that was what awaited him in the magical world. It should have left him desperate for people who would love him and open to accepting the guidance of anyone who cared for him. Dumbledore had also spent 10 years subtly encouraging a sort of mythos about the boy who lived as a legendary figure, with the intention that Harry would never be able to live up to it. He would be too nervous around groups of people to possibly fill the image people had of him, which would have left the students who actually interacted with him disappointed and ended with him isolated from most of his schoolmates. And at the same time, his name would have retained its rallying power among the masses of witches and wizards outside of Hogwarts. The people Harry never interacted with to use this influence, allowing Dumbledore to use Harry's name among those people to advance the opposition against Voldemort once again when it became necessary. Instead, somehow, they got this very different version of Harry Potter. A boy far too confident with charisma beyond anything Dumbledore had seen in such a young child. He had never seen a child stride down to the sorting hat, with hundreds of students watching and whispering with such grace in his movements and confidence in himself. Someone willing to so openly speak his beliefs to the sorting hat in front of the entire student body with no fear. Combined with his massive magical potential, if Hagrid's report of the events of Ollivander's shop meant anything, and he might really be able to live up to his legend. Of course that wasn't automatically a bad thing. He had always meant for Harry to be a leader in the second war against Voldemort he knew was coming. But he needed to be a leader only after Albus had a chance to shape him. The dangers of someone with such magical power and so many ready to follow him going dark were too great. The only Hogwarts student Albus had ever seen with similar potential, both in charisma and power, had been a 15 or 16 year old Tom Riddle. And the magical world likely wouldn't survive another like him, especially since the potential Tom Riddle had once exhibited, seemed to be even greater in young Harry. And there was also the risk of the possibility of Harry being a Horcrux. Albus had long suspected the possibility. There had been the residue of dark magical energies around the room in which Voldemort lost his physical form, which very few dark rituals other than the creation of the Horcrux would match, and no object that could possibly be a Horcrux had been present. The fresh curse scar created with the energies of the most powerful dark spell in existence would have been a natural receptacle for such dark energies though. This was further supported by the unsettling fact that Harry was a natural occlumens. Of course no one knew exactly why some rare people came to be natural Occlumens, but Harry's mind attempting to constantly defend itself against a piece of another's soul, might have caused such a thing. Certainly it wasn't proof, but it was additional evidence towards a very troubling conclusion. And Harry being a natural Occlumens was sure to be a problem as well. A natural Occlumens was immune not just to legitimacy, but to all forms of mental intrusion or magical manipulation. This meant that many of Albus's backup plans for Harry, should he start slipping away from the path Albus planned for the boy would be impossible. Albus didn't use the more powerful mental spells and potions, except in the most extreme of circumstances. Things like the Imperious Curse, Veritasurum, Amertentia, or similar potions for other emotions were far too obvious, not to mention rather immoral. People would immediately notice the differences in behavior. But the occasional minor loyalty potion, or one that makes someone just a little more likely to open up to someone already trusted, or just a little excessively jealous of someone, or so much more. These were where the true possibilities lay. Things so subtle no one noticed they were not their natural feelings. And after a time behaving under the influence of the potions, people would almost always continue acting in that manner, even after the potions were not longer given. If someone spent months feeling loyalty towards someone and acting in that manner, the weight of inertia in their actions would almost always have them continue acting that way. Not to mention the occasional light legitimacy to read Harry's thoughts and make sure the boy wasn't having any opposed to Albus's plans. Or some minor obliviation should he discover information he wasn't ready to handle. All of these would be impossible now. So between Harry's attitude and immunity to magical methods of manipulation, almost all avenues to make sure that Harry followed the path best for both the wizarding world as a whole, and for Harry himself were closed. Even his tentative plans for the mirror of her eyes were completely ruined. 
The mirror functioned by sending out an extremely subtle legilimency probe that searched for the deepest desire buried deep within the observer's mind, which a natural occlumens would likewise be totally immune to. The mirror of her eyes was just a mirror to a natural occlumens. It would have to be something to be considered later. For now, he had a meeting with Harry and the heads of houses to see what house Harry would end up in. At least he wanted to go to Gryffindor. A slither in Harry Potter would have been a disaster for obvious reasons, and either Hufflepuff or Ravenclaw would have made things almost as difficult. In Hufflepuff, he would have been surrounded with friends and supporters. It would have been impossible to isolate Harry and have him truly rely upon Albus's guidance. And in Ravenclaw, Harry would have been encouraged to gather as much magical knowledge as possible, which when combined with his obvious power, could possibly start him upon the same paths Tom had taken all those decades ago. But with Harry's agreement, it shouldn't be difficult to convince the other heads to allow Harry into Gryffindor. That was where everyone expected the boy who lived to go anyway. So after escorting Harry and the heads of houses to the room normally used for faculty meetings, Albus sat down and introduced the heads of the houses, before giving Harry a grandfatherly smile. So, Harry, my boy. You seem to have put us in a bit of a pickle. But you mentioned that you wanted to go into Gryffindor. Perhaps you could tell us a bit of why to help us decide if that is a good decision for you. Harry quirked an eyebrow as he looked around at Albus and the four other professors, spending a moment meeting Severus's glower with a confused widening of his eyes, before he finally shrugged and turned back to Albus. Well professors, I'm sure you are already aware that my parents were both Gryffindor, which seems to be an important part of a house placement for some reason. Then just going over the traits of each of the houses I have heard from people, it just seemed that I fit with Gryffindor best. Ravenclaw I immediately disregarded. No offense professor, he said as he looked over to Phileas with a nod and a lopsided smile. But I'm not really a fan of studying for its own sake. I don't mind doing the required work, or reading something occasionally if it is really interesting, but I don't like spending a lot of my free time sitting around studying. Phileas nodded graciously and replied in his squeaky voice. Of course, Mr. Potter. Not everyone is a good fit for my house. I hope you will find the required reading and work for my class interesting, but that is all I can ask of you. Harry nodded back with a grin and continued, anyway, Slytherin was right out too. I'm a little too air well, blunt, I guess you could say. I don't think it would work out. Plus I heard a lot of people in that house are the children of the followers of the guy who killed my parents. Allegedly. He rolled his eyes dramatically and seemed to ignore the nervous shifting of the faculty as he continued. I don't think we would get along. Severus took this opportunity to snore contemptuously. As if a potter would ever have the brains or cunning to be in the house of Slytherin anyway. Harry just gave Severus a confused look once again before turning to Pomona. Um right. Whatever. Which just made Severus even more annoyed as Harry ignored his barb, but Harry just continued ignoring the fuming professor. Anyway, I thought about Hufflepuff a lot, because loyalty is important. But in the end, I thought Gryffindor would be a better fit. Harry grinned and looked around again, meeting everyone's eyes briefly except for Severus, who he continued to ignore. I jump off a two-story building's roof, once because my cousin bet me I wouldn't do it. It worked out pretty well too. He got in trouble with my aunt for causing me to mess up the bushes I landed on. Harry waited for the chuckles to die down. Anyway, I thought I would fit in pretty well in Gryffindor. And that's where all the friends I made on the train are too, so that is the house I would prefer. Albus nodded, still smiling gently at Harry before turning to Minerva, giving her a chance to respond. He knew she would be in favor in honor of James and Lily even if nothing else. Well, I can tell you are going to be trouble just like your father, Minerva began. But I suppose I do have the most experience dealing with such things. I think you are right that Gryffindor will be the best house for you. Do keep any trouble making to a minimum though. Severus snorted again, but everyone was ignoring him now. So, Alba stated happily. We are all agreed then. Harry will be in house Gryffindor. Most of the heads nodded, but Pomona obviously wasn't so quick to give up. Well, Mr. Potter said loyalty was also very important to him. And one of his reasons for wanting to be in Gryffindor is to be in the house with the friends he made on the train. That is obviously a very Hufflepuff attitude. She then turned to address Harry directly, and I promise you will be able to find many new friends easily within Hufflepuff, as well as maintain friendships with any Gryffindors you wish. Hufflepuff and Gryffindor have always gotten along rather well. Albus had to force himself not to sigh. Of course Pomona would be the one to object. Minerva would take his lead, Severus would rather cut off his own arm than accept a potter into his house, and Phileas was intelligent enough to accept that Harry didn't belong in Ravenclaw. But Pomona would truly wish Harry to go to the house she believed he would be happiest in. And she could be quite stubborn at times. She tended to focus far too much on the individual happiness of her students, rather than what was best for the wizarding world. It was most frustrating at times. And there was likely a bit of a desire to have the boy who lived bring prestige to the least respected of the houses as well. Of course you would never understand just how important that lack of respect was. 
groups that saw themselves as oppressed, even if just in minor or subtle ways, always looked for an influential leader to support them. And as the leader of the light, he was the natural choice for the almost universally light Hufflepuffs. The Hufflepuffs which, with their hard-working mentality, formed the backbone of both the ministry and the wizarding economy. True, it was often not in the more visible positions of leadership, but Hufflepuff support had, in many ways, helped him push the wizarding world in the right direction to an even greater extent than the Gryffindors. That wasn't exactly something he could explain to Pomona, as yet another reason Harry needed to go to Gryffindor though. So instead, he smiled gently at the woman and replied, yes indeed. Harry does seem to possess both traits of Hufflepuff and Gryffindor most strongly. A powerful combination, to be sure. But as the sorting hat suggested, our choices of what sort of person we want to be do have a powerful influence on who we will become. When the traits of two houses are equal, it is our choices which define us. Albus looked around among the other staff members for a moment before meeting Harry's gaze with a gentle smile as he continued, I think that James and Lily Potter would be quite proud to see their child enter into Gryffindor. A proud and brave lion who yet remembers the importance of friendship, loyalty, and hard work. Of course bringing out the topic of James and Lily was a bit underhanded. Who could deny the wish of the people who had died to defend their child? The fact that giving an orphan, no matter how confident or self-assured, the idea that their parents would be proud of him, would have Harry looking to Albus to provide guidance of what else he could do to make them proud, was certainly an additional benefit. But eventually the other heads gave nods of agreement, and even Pomona gave a reluctant nod, though she quickly made one last comment to Harry, well, if you are sure Mr. Potter. I know that Hufflepuff would certainly welcome you, and that you could do very well in my house, but if you are determined to go to Gryffindor, I will not stand in your way. Albus waited for Harry to give his silent but firm nod before stating, very well. As the headmaster of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, with the support of the heads of each of the four houses, I declare Harry Potter to be officially sorted into Gryffindor House. So mote it be. He then watched with a satisfied smile as the edges of Harry's robes changed to Gryffindor colors, and the Gryffindor crest appeared over Harry's chest. And perhaps helping Harry get into his desired house would create the beginning of the trust Albus needed Harry to have in him over the coming years. All for something Albus wanted anyway. It was always best when things worked out that way. Alright. Why don't you take Harry to his dorm Minerva? And the rest of you can see to your students as well. I'm sorry for keeping you. Oh, but Severus. If you could stay for just a moment, I would appreciate it. After the others filed out, a still scowling Severus Snape was left alone in the room with Albus. So, did you get anything at all? Albus asked quietly. No, Severus snorted back. His defenses are like a wall, solid beyond anything I have ever seen before. Though from what I have read, natural Occlumens are supposed to have minds that are just impossible to find at all. As if they don't have minds at all, they are so well hidden. Not like this infinite barrier in Potter's mind. Albus nodded thoughtfully. Of course he had tried a gentle surface legitimacy scan as well, but because of the more antagonistic relationship which Severus could afford to create with Harry, Severus could be more direct about it. If Harry felt anything strange from Severus, he would attribute it to the strange glares the man was giving, rather than an attempt at magically intruding into his mind. Yes, that was the indication I have gotten, but there haven't really been enough natural Occlumens through Hogwarts to know if they are all the same. There is no way he could have had a chance to study the art in the Muggle world. And those defenses, whatever they are, are far beyond anything I have ever seen before. Far beyond what you or even I could hope to accomplish. A natural Occlumens is the only explanation. And it wasn't like there were a lot of natural Occlumens who developed the ability because their mind was constantly subconsciously fending off attacks from an implanted Horcrux, so it wasn't unlikely there would be some differences. Severus snorted in derision. Again. Sometimes Albus had to wonder if all that snorting was bad for Severus's sinuses. The boy is just like his father. He is going to be a nightmare. Already causing problems on the first night. Now Severus, Albus replied in a placating tone. He doesn't even really look that much like his father. His hair is much shorter and he doesn't wear glasses. Honestly, he looks much more like his mother with those eyes and his cheekbones. And clearly this wasn't his fault. He can't help that he happens to be a natural Occlumens, as inconvenient as that might be. Severus frowned severely. He is nothing like her. Did you see the way he was arrogantly strutting around? Showing off his scar like he was proud of the reminder of his parents' death. Arguing with a centuries-old sorting hat as if he knows better. He outright told his teachers he isn't going to study, for Merlin's sake. He's going to be a menace just like his father, I guarantee it. Albus just sighed in resignation. There wasn't any point in arguing with Severus on this topic. Although his unthinking antagonism towards Harry would likely be useful from time to time, it was frustrating discussing it with the normally very logical man. On this one topic, Severus was incapable of being rational and unbiased in any way. Which made him predictable, but sometimes he would prefer Severus could just set aside his ridiculous prejudice and act towards the greater good regardless of his own feelings. 
Alright, Severus, you can go tend to your new Slytherins, Albus said as he waved his hand vaguely in the direction of the door to the room, as he began to spend a few more moments in thought about the latest information on Harry. Unfortunately, these moments of introspection were rather quickly put to an end. Severus had risen from his seat and attempted to stomp off as was usual for him when he was in one of his snits, but rather quickly ended lying on the floor instead. What in Merlin's name? Severus exclaimed as he lifted himself from his sprawled position to look down at his feet. My shoelaces are tied together. These shoes don't even have shoelaces. But his tone of shock and amazement quickly turned to fury as he looked up at Albus. Potter did this, the potions professor growled so harshly his words were barely even perceptible. He lifted himself up to a sitting position on the floor, and pulled out his wand to send a savage severing charm, to cut the tied together shoelaces with enough force to scar the stone floor between his feet. And now that Albus had a chance to look at them, he agreed that it was clear they did not originally come with the shoes, though in his opinion, they gave the shoes a very interesting look in spite of the lack of actual need for shoelaces. Perhaps he could get some like that. You see what I told you? Severus continued in his angry diatribe, too quickly for Albus get his own words in as the man carefully clambered back to his feet. Only the first night in Hogwarts, and already he is at it. This is just the beginning Albus. You need to rein him in now or I will do it for you. Albus nearly groaned. He didn't need this additional aggravation, so he tried to say as soothingly as possible, now Severus. You know as well as I do that there is no possible way Harry could be responsible for this. He was in front of us for the entire time he was in the room and never even drew his wand. The boy doesn't even know any magic yet anyway. I'm sure it is simply a case of the Weasley twins finding out how to delay the onset of a spell over the summer, and wanting to try it out as soon as possible. You know how they are. Albus chuckled with amusement as he thought back on their frequent antics, and pulled out his own wand to cast a silent finite on the shoes, to restore them to their original shoestring-less state, only to rock back in his chair in shock as nothing changed. Now that is interesting, he said quietly as he examined the shoes more closely. In fact, it looked like the apparently very real shoelaces had somehow forced small holes through the leather of Severus's shoes, as they laced themselves before tying together between the two shoes. An interesting bit of animation spellwork, whoever had performed it. It was Potter. I know that it was, Severus predictably responded. I don't know how, but I know that it was him. You can't just let him get away with this. Now Severus, Albus responded, audibly sighing this time. It can't have been Harry. I'm sure the entire faculty will do their best to try and determine who the culprit was, but you cannot just assume everything is Harry's fault without any reason. Harry walked along beside McGonagall looking around at all of the paintings and suits of armor lining the walls, as he thought back to his little prank on Professor Snape. It was pretty minor and rather simplistic for him, but sometimes that type of prank was a lot of fun too. Though he did prefer to see the reaction to his pranks, but this had been just a spur of the moment thing, as he saw Snape glowering at him for no reason and insulting him, apparently simply for being a potter. Perhaps the Snapes and the Potters had some sort of ancient blood feud. Wizarding society seemed archaic enough for that sort of thing to be relatively common, so it seemed likely, given how Snape had been treating his last name as a curse. That would likely make potions classes a little awkward. Fortunately, Harry didn't really care about his grades. And if Snape wanted to restart some feud Harry had never even heard of well, that sounded like a perfectly valid source of entertainment to him. As Snape continued his glares and undeserved insults, Harry could always escalate to more intricate and interesting pranks from there. Honestly, if the man had any intelligence at all, he would realize that anyone who could successfully create even so simplistic a prank with only moments notice directly in front of the senior staff, wasn't someone it was a good idea to annoy without cause. For some reason, he doubted it. He had to repress his grin though. He was sure word of what had happened would make its way to McGonagall quickly enough, so it would be best if she didn't remember him having a strange mischievous grin walking away from the meeting. Eventually, after a fairly lengthy walk mostly in silence, with the occasional comment about Hogwarts or Hogwarts rules, Professor McGonagall stopped, motioning to the painting of a rather large woman as she explained, this is the entrance to Gryffindor Tower. It will be your home 10 months of the year for the next 7 years. To enter, you must give the fat lady a password, which will be changed regularly. As Professor McGonagall paused at this point, Harry quickly interrupted with a confused look, wait why is there a password? As I understand it, the paintings are aware and have memory. Why can't they just remember who is in Gryffindor and allow us in? The password could easily be overheard by someone from another house. McGonagall looked a little surprised, but also with an edge of disapproval in her expression. A password is traditional. Harry rolled his eyes, though he didn't say anything. There had to have been a reason to start the tradition, so that answer was ultimately just avoiding of the question. Probably because she didn't know the answer. Teachers never liked appearing ignorant in front of their students. Though perhaps the eye roll wasn't a good idea, because McGonagall's expression changed from slightly disapproving to an outright frown as she continued harshly, the current password is Kappa Draconis. Remember it. 
Once the password was given, the painting nodded regally at Professor McGonagall, and swung open to reveal the Gryffindor common room. Apparently those inside the common room had been waiting for them too, because it took less than a second for the Gryffindors to see Harry through the opening entrance and begin cheering. The Weasley twins even began a chant of We Got Harry, which was picked up by a significant portion of the rest of the crowd in the common room, though many were content with just cheering loudly. Harry just grinned and strode into the room, waving around at everyone good-naturedly. He was still a little unhappy with being famous for something he was relatively certain his mother had been responsible for, but he was pretty used to being famous. And fame was a lot better than what he had expected coming into the wizarding world. So he might as well make use of it until he had a chance to become famous for his own actions. It took a couple minutes for the cheering to die down, but when it finally did, Harry yelled out, Thank you everyone for your great welcome. I am proud to say that I was able to convince the headmaster and the heads of the houses to put me into the best house at Hogwarts. Of course this drew further cheers. There wasn't anything wrong with some occasional pandering though. McGonagall just shook her head, though she looked to be repressing a bit of a smile now, which was certainly an improvement. Once things died down, she looked around with one of her stern gazes and said, Alright. That's enough of that. It's about time all of you went off to bed. Classes start tomorrow. She turned to Harry as she continued, I'm sure someone can show you to your dorm, Mr. Potter. I will see you in the morning to hand out schedules. With that she gave him a smile, if a brief one, and turned to walk out of the still open entryway to the tower. Harry just waited for the door to close, then turned back to the crowds with a grin and said, Well, from what I hear, one of the things that makes Gryffindor the best house, is that Gryffindors throw the best parties. This brought more cheers and a great deal of laughter, though Harry did notice Hermione off in one corner, frowning rather harshly at that comment. But eventually one of the Weasley twins came forward and slapped Harry on the back, while the other dragged out a keg of what the other twin explained was butterbeer. It looked to be the beginning of a very long night. McGonagall was probably not going to be pleased, come morning. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoyed. If you want the next part of this video, like subscribe and comment down below, and turn on the bell notification. And also check out other videos that I have created and enjoy. See you in the next video. Peace.